So I think we had a great first half. What do you think? Ellen and Mark, they were fantastic, weren't they? Really great. So now we're gearing up for the second half. And our first act in the second half is uh, Dave Penny. Now, Dave uh, has a guest playing with him. Don Lee is going to join him. Uh, Don's recently moved back home from wherever he was, somewhere on the other side of the world. Always great to see people move back home, don't you think? Uh, I first actually met Dave. It's funny. Uh, the first time I met Dave was at the Loggers Museum, out just outside of Grand Falls. And uh, I think I was out there doing a gig or something. I was doing a, I used to run a concert series in the museums back in the, back in the 90s. And uh, Dave was out there, and the first, my memory, enduring memory of Dave is that he's standing there next to the chopping block, picking up the axe and throwing axes, you know, to trees and onto trees and so on. No wonder there's, you know, no pine-clad hills left anymore. Um, but uh, Dave is an avid outdoorsman, of course, and he's also a great performer, accordion player, composer, uh, writer of uh, some great recitations uh, about uh, life in Newfoundland. So I would like you to give him a big welcome, and he'll bring on Don uh, shortly. But first of all, let's hear it for Dave Penny. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Oh, look at this. We're the same height. Or oh, were you just talking about this one? That's the same one, too. Uh, yeah. Where's the stand to? Oh, this is great. We're the same height. This is grand, yeah. We do that for the aesthetics. Uh, Welcome, uh, please, I'm very happy to be joined again tonight by Dan Lee. He plays everything. He plays it very well, which takes a huge load off me and makes it all that much more fun and sounds better and all that great stuff. Please welcome my good buddy here and the very talented Dan Lee. Also, too, sitting there all night, I was thinking, geez, by I didn't, uh, I'm after forgetting all the traditional songs that I know, uh, most of them anyway. But I will say, what's that? What's Frank? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm also not going to go over too much because I can't wait to hear Frank play the accordion <laughs> after this. Um, but anyway, so it's true, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's great to hear all these old traditional songs, and I will say honestly and truly, seeing Eleanor down there especially, that uh, the songs that we're going to do uh, tonight, they are ones that I came up with, but I would never have if it wasn't for, uh, well, traditional songs in general, obviously, there wouldn't be any songs if it wasn't for traditional songs. And the song circle that, uh, that Eleanor is one of the hosts for, it's, it's the last Thursday of every month at the Crow's Nest, and I've been going there for years, and you pick up all these songs, and then, uh, you know, one thing leads to another, and here you are singing about Chase the Ace fundraisers, which is what we're gonna do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyway, good thing about playing here in St. John's is that you don't have to explain what the Chase the Ace game is, everybody knows. And here we go. One, two, three. My name is Joseph Burry and I am 59. The cost of living here is getting higher all the time. I work 10 hours every day, may have to work some more, like everybody else, to keep the wolf out from the door. Things are left to pay off, she's after getting slow. I got the house tore up with renovations on the go. Winter coming on, I have so many bills to face. So I'm going out to pay the bird to chase the ace. The news was spreading so fast, it was almost harsh. Raising money for the Catholics over at Assumption Parish. The ace was over $700,000 strong. They came from Labrador and up the shore and up along. They came into the harbor, there was nowhere to land. Weddings were cut off because there was no room to stand. A woman on a pedal bike came in from Harbor Grace on the shoulder of the road to pay the bird to chase the ace. I jumped in the bandwagon and started into brew. A northeast Avalon out to Conception Bay Carbou. By the time we were assembled, it was a hundred plus. We hired a couple of drivers who worked at Metro Bus. So we filled the vessels up. It was the 8 and 24. Changed in there, we had all we could do to close the door. Poor Dennis asked to get on. I said, boy, we got no space. You'll have to mum a ride to pay the bird to chase the ace. I hadn't been through. I had the plan all laid out. It was a week away. After the win, I cashed it in. 
and bring it home that day. I took the lock and key and the metal box to stuff seven hundred thousand dollars. It would be big enough. Because the odds are one to forty thousand in this game. I got eight thousand dollars from the bank before we came. The bus pulled into town and all hands began to brace themselves to give her to the church hall to try to trace the ace. The volunteers were sat down with faces stern and hard. Protective of that $700,000 card. Tickets were $2 each, a tree for five, you see. So I got 13,333. They called a lucky number out and I began to fidget. I kept repeating in my head the lucky seven digit. I sat down with 16 rolls of tickets in the basement of the Roman Catholic Church and Bay Verde to chase the ace. I hadn't been through one roll before we heard the ball. A woman came into the church bouncing off the walls. She jumped around delirious as if to rub it in. I left my rolls where they were too because they didn't win. It didn't matter who it was, I didn't even look. Instead, I slid out through the door and was a proper sook. But the woman with the ticket in her hand was in a race. Oh, she won the daily jackpot and was in the chase the ace. Well, good for you. I got back to the house that evening, quarter after ten. My sons and daughters and their kids were there to my chagrin. I figured since they were all there when they broke the news, they could dispense of me whatever way that they would choose. My one to 40,000 odds, it must have been a first. With winter coming on, I was financially embarrassed. I had to tell the wife and kids our credit is erased. I spent it all to go to Betty Bird to chase the ace. They had no idea that we were in a mess. Because they ran up to me in shock from happiness. But it turned out, my darling wife, she was the one I heard. Who came in with the winning ticket out in Baby Bird. We got the pot and now we're sat I'm off the hook because she drew a card and sure enough the ace of spades it was. If I play this game again to save me from disgrace, I'll only buy one ticket when I go to chase the ace. Thank you. One of these days, it'll be a traditional song. Once all our records are lost and all that stuff. Um, one of the recurring themes uh, tonight, uh, was it kind of? Love songs? That's a thing, isn't it? Uh, but you often hear, you know, the stories of uh, different variations of people going to sea and leaving somebody behind and, you know, uh, Tarry sailors courting a wealthy daughter or, you know, farmers courting daughters and whatever and all this kind of stuff. I took, I sort of put my own spin on that in modern day uh, context and I wrote one called A Townie Courted a Bayman's Daughter. And I sort of started introducing the, or this song and then I, I was making the comparison and I said, now wait, if it's a townie courting a Bayman's daughter, then which one is the royalty, which one is the tarry sailor? And I made that thought out loud and I said, oh, now what am I going to do? <laughs> I still don't have an answer for that. Anyway, a townie courted a bayman's daughter. Let's just say it's a traditional song for tonight. A townie courted a bayman's daughter. He grew up on Pleasant Street and she was from fresh water. They took the metro bus each day going back and forth to Mun. One day they met on the Route 1. One day they met on the Route 1. They took the metro bus each day, going back and forth to Mun. One day they met on the Route 1. On that bus he tried to be nearer. But he was by the middle door, and she was back in the rear. He went up to the front and took a schedule from the rack and went down to the back and went down to the back. He went up to the front and took a schedule from the rack and went down to the back. He tried to make some conversation. So I'm glad the bus strike's over, sure I had no transportation. 
He knew that all he needed was her name, and then he'd get her on Facebook or Twitter, on Facebook or Twitter. He knew that all he needed was her name, and then he'd get her on Facebook or Twitter. On that boss day, he talked every day. One morning, he asked her if he could follow her around the bay. I went around the bay one time right out to Caligroos. Isn't that out by yous? Isn't that out by yous? I went around the bay one time right out to Caligroos. Isn't that out by yous? Oh, no, she said, by your foolish ass. You wouldn't have a clue about any town outside the overpass. But yes, she said, come on and see the house set in fresh water. Just don't mind my fodder. Just don't mind my fodder. But yes, she said, come on and see the house set in fresh water. Just don't mind my fodder. The town he met, his new girlfriend's dad. He liked the man, but couldn't understand a single word he said. He sat there with a vacant smile, and so the father thought, is this man stoned or what? Is this man stoned or what? He sat there with a vacant smile, and so the father thought, is this man stoned or what? <laughs> a few months passed, and they grew closer. He asked her, will you marry me before the summer's over? She threw her arms around him and said, yes, indeed I do, but where will we get married to? But where will we get married to? He, she threw her arms around him and said, yes, indeed I do, but where will we get married to? I say the two of us should go. Get married on a sunny beach somewhere alongside Mexico. Your uncle owns those cabins on the road out by Rishoon. We'll go there for the honeymoon. We'll go there for the honeymoon. Your uncle owns those cabins on the road out by Rishoon. We'll go there for the honeymoon. They didn't move out around the bay. Instead, they built a new house out behind the ghouls in Galway. The wife said, when my crowd are in town, I'll give them a key, and they can stay with we, and they can stay with we. The wife said, when my crowd are in town, I'll give them a key, and they can stay with we. So the groom, he built himself a little shed. It had a cooler and a stove and a couch that folds out to a bed. The father-in-law sized it up and said to him, by Paul, you're not stunned after all. You're not stunned after all. The father-in-law sized it up and said to him, by Paul, you're not stunned after all. <laughs> all right. So there was also, a, in Ellen's uh, awesome set, a spooky story. Uh, and I'm going to do one sort of, but well, it's kind of spooky, I guess you could say. It was written by a dead guy. <laughs> In a way, <laughs> I guess that's spooky. Uh, my, uh, in Eastport, where my father's from, uh, I got some relatives still out there now, and one of them is my great uncle Harv. And he was telling me a story about a, um, a guy in Minchin's Cove. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Minchin's Cove. It's this gorgeous little spot in Terranova National Park. It's a campground now, like an, a backpacking thing. And it used to be a pretty thriving uh, logging town. And I was going out there um, for an overnight hike, and he told me this story about... Um, a guy who used to work there from some Scandinavian country, nobody knew much about him um, because he didn't speak English or he didn't speak very much. But anyway, he got killed uh, and, and this, uh, working for this sawmill, he got hit in the head with a pit prop, apparently, which is what they were, one of the things that they were making there, like three foot long pieces of board for mine shafts and whatever. Anyway, that's where he met his fate. And since they didn't know much about him, they used to call him the stranger. You know, we'll get the stranger to look after that or whatever. So in the Eastport Anglican Cemetery, it's there, it's a white cross, and it says the stranger on it, which is spooky. So anyway, now, it's not as romantic now because they did track down the guy's name. It says Mackenzie now, but it still says the stranger and then Mackenzie underneath it. But uh, So anyway, it's still a spooky story. So anyway, he went and wrote a song and called it the Minchin Cove Ghost. Um, actually, the, I was the one, but it doesn't make me... Dead, not yet anyway. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. Where am I going with that? Shut up and sing the song. Okay, one, two, 
I'm not from here, didn't know anyone. I had to find some work that I could do. Came here to fish from across the big pond, and I got lost from the rest of the crew. After the war, when I came to this foreign place on a big trawler, well, I got stranded, they must the last count, and left and sailed out, and I had to stay here in Newfoundland. It was cold here and empty, so well I remember I wouldn't have come here if only I'd known. Last time I checked, was early November, little provisions I had here alone. Before it was winter, I had to get into a place to stay. I didn't stop roving, traveling around outside Newman Sound and ended up setting up in Minchin's Cove. I wasn't a logger, but they hired me on. I worked for the sawmill for William John King. We cut and hauled our timber down to the pond, sawed it to length and then laid it on slings. And rolling wood towed a loaded raft over where they had a water chute. It never stops. Logs went downhill straight into the mill where they cut railroad ties and tree foot pit props. Early December, and it was a fine day. I was down in the cribbing with young Johnny Brown. He was passing the props along over my way when somebody sung out and I turned around. A piece of wood hit me and then I went dizzy and I saw the world spin as I fell to the side. Down to the wood, they did all they could. They couldn't save me hard as they tried. In Eastport Cemetery is where they did bury me Down in the back with the Saunders and Moss Without much to say about me anyway They wrote the stranger along the White Cross Maybe some descendant will find where I rest And find out where I came from, where I had gone Minchin's Cove Town, outside Newman Sound Thousands of miles across the big pond In Minchin's Cove Town, outside Newman Sound Thousands of miles across the big pond. Figured I'd do a deep cut now, getting at that point where I can sort of, in case anybody's thinking nobody is, in case anybody's thinking, boy, I like these old stuff. Maybe one of these days somebody will be actually saying that. I like these old stuff. So I'm going to do something <laughs> from my first album, the old stuff, you know. Um, because I didn't, I haven't been singing this in so long because it was, it's uh, not so long, so long, 10 years, because it feels like it's dated now. But now that it's the Elm Spanworm thing has been so long past, it's sort of a you know it's sort of a memory now, as opposed to just some dated you know oh that was so last year. Now it's sort of eight or ten years ago. You can start you know singing about those times <laughs> when the Elm Spanworm took over St. John's. So anyway, it's called the Ballad of the Elm Spanworm. <clears throat> I guess you could say it's a murder ballad close as it gets. The leaves are now forming and soon will hang o'er me, lest the span worms from last year hatch from their cocoons. Cause deciduous disaster then dangle down after swing before my face into my barbecue. Though I'd like to maim them, I can't say I blame them. They're actually quite clever, these crafty insects. Considering the snow we get, I would make no regrets. Wait until June before I resurrect. I didn't know they were there till the leaves disappeared. It was well then when I knew they were well on their way. And I didn't know, sir, what them little black dots were. And here all along, twas Elm Spanworm pupae. 
So then I was savage, for I knew they would ravage the clothesline on which hung shirts, pants, and dishcloths. And I know from last year that they'll hang around here till sometime in August and turn into mouths. All over the east, and they are hatching, and then they'll lynch up the maples, these destructive pests. There's not one leaf they misses, and photosynthesis is all tangled up as the spanworms head west. Some people make traps with packing tape wrapped round the trunks of the tree with the sticky side out. But their efforts are futile, so I'll not follow suit. I'll just stand there helpless and watch them hang about. If in July you flew over, you'd swear it is October, for all of the towering maples are nude. I see how it's misleading, but if you've seen them feeding, you would know that these trees are just elm spanware food. As the moths laid their eggs, all the town scratched their heads out to get one before one more year came and went. But Andy knows that these menaces would soon be for his nemesis, longtime mayor of Mount Pearl, Steve Canton, so he let them be. <laughs> to conclude and to finish, the trees did not diminish, nor did the worms end up in a neighboring town. Some felt the best way was to spray BTK, thinking that was the only means to bring them down. As the maples stood drooping, some small birds came swooping, went off with the moths, and the leaves grew back in. So next year, old, when they're in town, I'll chop our maples down, plant spruce, and not worry about spanworms again. <laughs> Going to sort of uh, step into the, the, uh, the world of biology. Oh, actually. I'm gonna, I would like to sort of retroactively throw out the ballad of the Amos Spamworm to Rick West here in the front uh, aisle. The entomologist in the room, <laughs> who helped me out with the pupae line, I think, yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, there's insects in, coming up too later on, so there you go, that's another one for you. But uh, in case we have any biologists in the room, this one is your time to shine. Uh, it's about bats, and uh, it's a, based on a true story. I got a buddy out in Hans Harbor, and he got a cabin out there. I go out there from time to time. Uh, it's funny, he works and I got the keys. I can go out there when he's working, uh, or I can go out there with him. And we were going around the area, and there's this nice little spot down on the pond. And I said, what a spot down by the pond. And he said, yeah, he said, it's for sale too. I said, go on. Uh, he said, you don't want to live there. He said, it's Nothing only work, you know, he's just falling apart and there's, the attic is full of bats. I said, what? Oh, the attic is full of bats and it's, you know, it's all falling apart. Anyway, I got into thinking about that. Bats in the attic kind of sounds a little poetic. Meanwhile, a buddy of mine, uh, John Goss, he's a biologist out in Terranova Park, and he was telling me about, uh, coincidentally, about the white nose syndrome. Now, I'm not making light of the white nose syndrome. It's just, you know, it's a serious thing. And it's causing, you know, these sicknesses in bats around North America. And apparently, our bats, at least at the time, were doing fine. And the reason why we were talking about it was because, you know, we're always bragging about how our blueberries got the most antioxidants. Well, now we can say that our bats have the healthiest noses or whatever. That's kind of <laughs> how the conversation went. So between the two things, uh, between the two conversations in the same week, uh, there goes bat rooms. Uh, yeah, all right then. One, two, three. There's bats up in the ceiling, in bats of insulation. I can hear them in the evening, batting all around the rafters. And I'm going up there after supper now, because I'm poison with the noise and all the mess they got made up there. I moved away when I was young and I worked up in the city. After several years had passed, it all came to a skid. So I moved back home and formed a one-man committee and moved up into the woods in a log cabin off the grid. I moved my belongings there and I got all settled, but the roof needed repair. It would leak for sure. I fixed it up as best I could with plywood and sheet metal And in no time at all I had a brand new roof on tour But there's bats up in the ceiling 
In bats of insulation I can hear them in the evening Batting all around the rafters And I'm going up there after supper now Cause I'm poisoned with the noise And all the mess they got made up there When I lived in the city It was always get away more Several hundred lived in the building I was at and now instead of living under several hundred neighbors, I lived under an attic space with several hundred bats. When I fixed up that roof, I didn't realize that they had chewed a hole somewhere up there in the east. And cozy it up in there, sure they multiplied in size, for that pink insulation is a fine place to conceive. Bats up in the ceiling, in bats of insulation, I can hear them in the evening, batting all around the rafters, and I'm going up there after supper now, cause I'm poisoned with the noise and all the mess they got made up there. But I read that bats were in decline Because the white no syndrome was tearing through the country So I'll put up with them now And I'll make some little bat rooms With viewing holes into them And I'll charge ten bucks a gander When the tourists come around Since I never did find the spot Where they were getting in and out First or last through the gable or the roof I'll put a sanctuary in the attic space instead And old egg curtains on the ceiling down below for soundproof And there'll be bats up in the ceiling in bats of insulation They'll be up there squealing, sure you knows They'll be at it, batting all around the attic But I won't hear them in the Newfoundland Batatarium In the Newfoundland Batatarium This is another true story. Now, unlike a lot of the true stories that I tell, this one is its almost word for word true, except for I changed the names. But it's a story about a guy who goes away and leaves his house uh, for the summer for his son to look after. The son in the story was me. I was supposed to look after my father's house anyway. And uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the smell of Capelin is bad enough at the best of times. <laughs> Let alone when it's left outside, unbeknownst to anybody, in a house for at least a couple of weeks, which is what happened here. And me, supposed to go up and check on the place every week. I didn't go up there for quite a while. At that point, you know, it was kind of beyond repair. Actually, and Rick, uh, I called Rick too in a big state <laughs> at one point. Uh, but that didn't make the song. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's, uh, it's called The One About the Capelin Tray. And what is that you make? Yeah, okay. One, two, three. There have been many examples of me being scatterbrained. I listened to what I did before I boarded on the plane. We left on a Friday night, was traveling by air. It was a trip to Edmonton, my sister was up there. I had the gear all packed up for the two weeks we'd be gone. I locked the door and hid the key for my young fella John. To mind the house when I was away, so I locked the doors. Forgot I left the tray of Caitlin on the basement floor. A few days later, John went in to notice something off. A stench was in the air inside the house, it made him cough. He left the windows open, then when he checked back in a few days, the smell that was in the house was worsening. In fact, when he pulled in the driveway and got out of the car, the maple trees outside the windows he had left ajar were falling down as if to say, I can't take this no more. Someone must have left a tray of Caitlin on the basement floor. So he went in the back door, and when he went inside, the stench that was in the air before was ten times amplified. Plants were almost to the door, the flower pots they dragged across the floor, but it was buckled up and all the carpet shake. 
Bulbs were melted from the fat lights hanging from the ceiling. Pictures falling off the walls and all the paint was peeling. When he went down over the stairs and started to explore, he found there was a tray of cabling on the basement floor. So he went in the room and started to evaluate. He was responsible for this and he couldn't wait. Should he remove the tray somehow and wipe the basement floor down? Or should he leave it where the zoo get out and beat it out of town? Scooping up the tray, it wasn't so easy as it sounds. There were several hundred flies buzzing all around. Johnny boy got loving, the flies he did ignore. Attracted to the tray, he kept on the basement floor. From this point on, the story's too disgusting to repeat. But now I'm not the most beloved person living on the street. We'll never know how Johnny got the tape and out of the house. He must have covered his face and held his breath because it was some Fausty. And in any case, the house didn't rock and crumble down. Although it is one of the most avoided ones in town. Every second day, the house is laddered up and rinsed. And has been wrapped in plastic and tarpaulin ever since Nobody's gonna buy it now, I'm stuck with this chore Because there was a tray of capelin on the basement floor Thank you. Lumsden. Okay. There we go. Okay. It's funny. It's great to be singing such, you know, songs about zany uh, topics like this in the School of Music. You know, it's such a prestigious <laughs> event. It's kind of a funny juxtaposition. Another thing that you find in folk music, this is my last number. Thanks very much to everybody involved. Um, Jim and Spencer and uh, Megan and everybody else who's involved. It really is a lovely thing you're doing, and I hope you continue doing it. I hope you all continue to support it. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful thing, especially this time of year when there's not as much going on. Uh, so, yeah, good on everybody. Going to finish off with one, and one of the things we're noticing in this folk song, um, you know, talking about folk songs and whatever, is oftentimes tunes are recycled. Tunes are recycled or... Lyrics are recycled here and there, and themes are recycled anyway, in general. Uh, and nowadays, you know, they call it parodies. But in the folk song tradition, you can say that you borrowed the tune from, or you borrowed the air from whatever. So I borrowed the tune of the Rocky Road to Dublin and uh, just sort of made it something new. It's called the Rocky Road to Lumsden now. At least it is for the next two minutes and 45 seconds. It has nothing to do with the actual road that goes to Lumsden, you know, even though it is, you know, not in the best of shape. It has nothing to do with that anyway. It has a chorus. Don knows it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else do unless, you were on, unless you're on the YouTube. Anyway, here we go. The Rocky Road to Lumsden. <clears throat> On a dreary afternoon, after Sunday morning church in Rishoon, me and the boys were starting talking about what we had to do around the house and what was not working right. We found we had to get away the next Saturday. There was a wide array of things that we could bomb, then hit the road to go. Never mind the snow, with the camper in tow on the rocky road. The Lumsden Quarter after five, we run through Hare Bay and down the rocky road in Bonavista Bay with Mike Malone and Rob. We left for Shuna too, all excited, and we gathered up the food and the frying pan and piling up the gear and load her in the van. And that's the time of the year when we knows we can get out up in the woods. We said we should be sure to put up our hoods for when we're going in under all the boughs in the winter now. All the snow down, our next year will be frozen. That won't be nice. Run to Hare Bay and down the rocky road in Bonavista Bay with Mike Malone and Rob. 
In Lumsden town we reached and Robbie's cousin owns a cabin on the beach and now it wasn't known we thought there was no food but it was a fallacy Robbie found a stew from a meat locality and some tout and dough so then you know a fire on the go on the beach and then we could have stayed inside we were satisfied quickly petrified when we spied a bear 400 pounds or five run to Air Bay down the rocky road in Bonavista Bay with Mike Malone and Rob Oh, the boys woke up the bear, all sedated, and he came out of his lair. Irritated as the pot began to boil, we didn't know what to do, cause supper now was spoiled when he ate the stew. But he wasn't done, so we turned to run, that was pretty stunned, but it didn't matter. We was hard of roar, couldn't go no more, stayed on the shore, on the betty catters for to stay alive. Run to Hair Bay, down the rocky road in Bonavista Bay, with Mike Malone and Rob. The kids got out of school and they saw us there like a pack of fools cornered by the bear. We thought they'd help us quick, but they got their cameras out and put the pictures up on Instagram. The bear went back to bed. We could have fled, but we figured instead we'd go and get some things because it was so nice looking out over the ice without our devices here until the spring. Made a 25 run to Hair Bay and down the rocky road in Bonavista Bay with Mike Malone and Rob. Thank you. All right, Dave Penny with Don Lee. Well done, boss. Okay, uh, moving on now to the last act of the evening it gives me a particular pleasure, really, to introduce these, uh, the Mars Bars and uh, the four individuals that make up the band. Uh, Dave mentioned Rick earlier on. Rick was behind, uh, I don't know if you remember, the, the Snotty Var project. What year was that? I was trying to figure out. It was a few years ago now uh, when Rick, it was 96, it wasn't that long ago. Rick and, and Frank and a bunch of other local instrumental musicians uh, got together and did a, and did a recording. Uh, the CD's out there on the table, actually. It's just an excuse for me to mention it, actually, Rick. Uh, so uh, Rick and Frank Marr, of course, whom, uh, I don't know, first when I came to St. John's, Frank was the bartender down at the Harbor Inn and managing the place. And every once in a while, when the business was slow, he'd haul the accordion out and play a few tunes. He went on to play, you know, really to become uh, an icon, really, of the traditional music scene in the in the province, played with Figgy Duff, the Planker Down Band, uh, uh, you know, backed up uh, Pamela Morgan on a bunch of her albums and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then there's uh, Christina and Jean, uh, Christina Smith and Jean Houston, who are going to start off this, uh, this set. I actually met Christina when she was at music school at University of Western Ontario was the first time I met her. And it was right around the same time that I started playing that Jean was with a band called the Barkin Kettle. And uh, both of them have uh, really been in the forefront of the traditional music scene in the province ever since, both collecting, uh, playing with a variety of people, uh, you know, um, session musicians and, and so on. And perhaps the biggest contribution they made really has been, a, a lot of it has been around music education. Besides all their collecting and all the playing and so on they've done, I would say between the two of them, they have taught music to probably a thousand or more students over the years. And uh, Christina with the Suzuki uh, fiddling uh, group and Gene and private guitar lessons and so on. And, uh, you know, it's astonishing to me always how many uh, musicians I come across now who are adults and, you, you know, you ask them where they started playing or so on, and they studied with either Christina or Gene. So it's uh, really great and highly appropriate that they would be finishing off uh, the show here tonight. So would you please welcome Gene Hewson and Christina Smith. And they'll bring on Frank and Rick in a bit. Well, Gene was uh, tuning up there. I'll tell you a funny story. Gene was talking about uh, teaching. I had a little fella today, and he was squeezing the neck of the fiddle like crazy. So I said, okay, now I'm going to put my finger underneath your thumb, right? And when you squeeze, I'm going to scream. <laughs> so I did, and he did. <laughs> and I said, ow. And he said, oh, he said, I thought you were going to scream like an opera singer. <laughs> I'm about to do that for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start off with a song that I've been singing for a very, very long time. And uh, I think this festival is great because, you know, Mark was saying that there are certain songs that perhaps you won't be hearing down uh, at George Street and uh, uh, don't get a chance to do kind of uh, ballady things or unaccompanied things very often. So uh, uh, I have been singing this song for almost 40 years. And when my, my dad... 
uh, came to Newfoundland many years ago, back in the 50s, uh, from England. He's an Englishman. He started collecting Newfoundland folk song books. And when I was a kid, he had this book of uh, arrangements of Newfoundland folk songs done by various people for the piano that had been collected by Maud Carpeles, who was a woman who had come here in, in the 20s to collect folk songs. And she collected this song from um, uh, a couple by the name of Monks, Mr. and Mrs. Kenneth Monks, who lived in, in Kings Cove, uh, Bonavista Bay. <clears throat> and um, uh, anyway, it's a murder ballad, so Ellen, this one's for you. <laughs> it has a, a refrain line, a couple of refrain lines. One of them, uh, the first refrain line in each verse is, all a lean a lideo. And the last refrain line in each of the verses is, on the bonny bonny banks of Virgio. <clears throat> Oh, three fair mates went out for a walk. All the and the light of oh, they met a robber on their way on, on the, the bonny bonny banks of Virgio. He took the first one by the hand. All the lean and the light of while he whipped around and he made her stand on the bonny bonny banks of Virgio. Will you be a robber's wife? All the lean and the light of or will you die by my penknife on the bonny bonny banks of Virgio? I will not be a robber's wife. All the lean and the light of I'd rather die by your penknife on the bonny bonny banks of Virgio. He took out his little penknife. All the to lie to you, and it suddenly took her own sweet life on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. Well, he took the second one by the hand. All the lean to lie to you, and he whipped around and he made her stand on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. Who will you be a robber's wife? All the lean to lie to you, or will you die by my penknife on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio? I will not be a robber's wife. All the lean to lie to you, I'd rather die by your penknife on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. He took out his little penknife. All the lean to lie to you, and it suddenly took her own sweet life on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. Well, he took the third one by the hand. All the lean to my dear, and he whipped around and he made her stand on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. Will you be a robber's wife? All the lean to my dear, or will you die by my penknife on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio? I will not be a robber's wife. All the lean to my dear, nor will I. Die by your penknife on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. If my brothers had been here, all the lean to my dear, you wouldn't have killed my sisters dear on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. Where are your brothers, pray do tell? All the lean to my dear, oh, one of them is a minister on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. And where is the other one, pray do tell? All the lean to my dear, he's such a Dropping like yourself on, on the, the bunny bunny, bunny banks, banks of Virgio. Oh my God, what have I done? All the lean to my dear, I've killed my sisters all but one on, on the, the bunny bunny, bunny banks, banks of Virgio. Then he took out his little penknife. All the lean to my dear, and it suddenly took his own sweet life on the bunny bunny banks of Virgio. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Spencer, should I be playing through this one? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, all right. Um, we're going to play a set of Rufus Ginter tunes. And um, uh, it, it just occurred to me to think that the last time I think we played as a duo on this stage was um, when Mrs. Fenley was still alive. And that was our 25th anniversary concert, was it? Yep. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and nine years ago. Nine years ago. And Belle Fenley came up and joined us, and we actually played with her on stage here. And Frank was here as well, and we played, and Frank came up, and it was a great time. So, anyways, we're going to um, play a set of Mrs. Bell's tunes now. This is um, a set that comes from um, Ackfort, and she learned them from a man named <coughs> Bill Jones. And um, I've told this story so many times now, you've probably all heard it, that uh, Mrs. Bell started to play when she was about eight years old. She started to play for dances when Mrs. Fiend White 
uh, was bereaved, and Mrs. Fiend was the person who usually played for the dances. But then, of course, if, if somebody died belonging to you, you couldn't dance. You couldn't go to a dance. You couldn't even be seen at a dance. And so everybody in the community had to start uh, uh, pulling up the slack for, uh, for the fact that Mrs. Fiend couldn't play anymore. And so uh, her brother, Wash, would take Clarabelle Fenley by the hand and bring her up to the, to the dance, and they'd sit her on a barrel, she said, and pass her the courting, and then she would play for the dance. So this is a set she learned from a man named Bill Jones, uh, who played in Act Fort. And um, uh, there's six tunes in the, in the set for the square dance, uh, but we're only going to play four of them. So um, anyways, here's the set from, uh, from Mrs. Fenley. Um, and uh, the last one you'll notice is a little bit different, uh, because that was for the round house, and uh, she played jigs for the round house. Sharon told me, Sharon is Mrs. Bell's daughter, that uh, she and her, her both of her parents met in the roundhouse. And she, all of her childhood, she was looking around for the roundhouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, of course, round the house in the dance. <laughs>
Thank you. I'm going to do another song for you now. <clears throat> I learned this one from the singing of the uh, wonderful Becky Bennett from the Great Northern Peninsula, who was uh, um, one of our early uh, recipients of the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Folk Festival. And uh, she was not well enough when she won that award to be able to come up and uh, receive it. So myself and Christina, we teach at this music camp called the Vinline Music Camp, which is a traditional music camp that takes place out in uh, Gross Morn every August. When we went out for the camp, we went up and uh, we, uh, we met Becky Bennett and we presented her with the award. And she, uh, she had a, it had been her birthday, I think, or it was going to be her birthday, so she was getting ready for a party. And she sang a little bit, and uh, we sang for her and played for her too, so it was really wonderful. And uh, this is a song of hers called Butter and Cheese. <clears throat> Attention all ye gentlemen, you've called on me to sing, but I can well assure you that I can do no such thing. But to know that you have called on me, I'll try my best to do. And when I comes to the chorus, I hope you'll join me too. And when I comes to the chorus, I hope you'll join me too. I went to courting of a cook, I'll tell you the reason why. For when I did get hungry, she would give me a reply. For when I did get hungry, she would give me some relief. Oh, she fed me on the very best of pies and plenty of fat beef. She fed me on the very best of pies and plenty of fat beef. When after my supper was over and I could eat no more, right to my sad surprise, then a knock came at the door. And where to go and hide myself, my God, I did not know. So it was up in the chimney top, by he went as black as any crow. It was up in the chimney top, by he went as black as any crow. They put on a raging fire and it almost touched my knees. It melted all my butter and it roasted all of my cheese. The master, he was standing by, he knew a rogue was there. For each time the butter did melt, oh, the fire went up in a flare. Each time the butter did melt, oh, the fire went up in a flare. Then out in the street I had to go, me shameful face to show. Me butter and cheese all melted and me face as black as a crow. The women began to laugh at me and the dogs began to howl. And the boys looked out the window, there goes butter and cheese and all. The boys looked out the window, there goes butter and cheese and all. Well, we're going to do uh, uh, one more set now before we have some very special guests up. <clears throat> okay, this is a set of tunes from uh, Rufus Ginchard. And... Uh, both of us were, were very privileged to know Rufus uh, back in the day, and uh, Jean got to play with him quite frequently. And um, um, do you want to tell them the famous story? About, sure, yeah. sure. Well, uh, there was one time, um, um, uh, I, I know uh, Jim, Jim and Kelly used to uh, do a lot of performing with Rufus, and on this particular occasion, they couldn't go to this gig, so Jim had asked if I could accompany Rufus to go up to Labrador to play at a Mun alumni di uh, dinner in, in Lab West. <clears throat> so, uh, so we went up, and anyway, we had this uh, wonderful dinner was uh, laid on, and uh, we performed at the first half of the event, and then we were allowed to take a little break and have dinner ourselves. 
So of course, I was looking at me watch all the time because I was aware we had to get back up and do another set. And uh, I was uh, wolfing down my food and I had me big turkey dinner gone. It was really good, turkey dinner with all the trimmings. And uh, anyway, Rufus was about two thirds of the way through his because he used to eat really slow and you know, he used to take his time and I, it's probably how he got to the age of 91. <laughs> And I said, Rufus, boy, come on now, we, we, we got to get back up. I said, hurry on, finish your dinner. I said, my God, boy, you eat just like a bird. And he said, so do you, my dear, like a gull. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I waited for him to finish. <laughs> and uh, duly chastened, uh, we did our second set. <laughs> And uh, the, a couple of these tunes are a little bit crooked. Uh, and a crooked tune, I, I like to explain this, and some people have heard me say this before, but if you, if you think of a tune in terms of a nursery rhyme, uh, they're usually in phrases of, be, of four. So usually it'll go, to market, to market, to buy a fat pig. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. To market, to market, to buy a fat hog. Home again, home again, jiggity jog. But in Newfoundland, they don't. They might go, oh, to market, to market, to market, to buy a fat pig. Home again, jig. Oh, to market, to market, to buy a fat home again, jiggity jog, jog. Okay, and you'll, you'll see what I mean when we play the first tune. Okay, so this is uh, Leonard Payne's tune, and after that, um, Boston. Boston Laddie, and then we're going to do um, Dr. Kylio.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, now we would like uh, to invite onto the stage the St. John's East candidate for the Rhinoceros Party, Mr. Frank Murr. <laughs> <clears throat> and his, uh, his presidential running mate, Rick West. <clears throat> You'll have to uh, excuse my play tonight. I, I washed my hands today and I can't do a thing with them. <laughs> All right. All right, Frank. They invited me out to a party, and I bought the old box just by chance. They asked me to sing, but I says, nah, I play a bit of a dance. So I picked up the box and began in the play, but the boys, they were scoffing about. So they cut a, they cut a big hole in the back of my box, and this is a tune that came out, or probably a waltz, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I, no, it was a tune, it was. Back in the 20s and the 30s, just when I was young for that. Anyway, uh, uh, there was a young once. I, I this man know. lived in South Boston. He was from Outer Cove somewhere. I forget his name now. I'll let him by next year when I comes back. Uh, 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 anyway, he uh, he came here because times were really bad in Boston during the 20s and 30s. So he said he'd go home to Newfoundland. But when he got here, he found things a lot worse. So he wrote this tune, and, and it was called, uh, he called it, Why Did I Leave South Boston?
Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having us at this great little festival. We're happy to be at the, re the inaugural event, and may she last uh, for a long, long time. Until we're all 100. Um, anyway, we're going to finish off now. Frank, what are you going to play? Do you remember? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feared. Uh, I think we had said we were going to play the grumbling old man and the old woman and a cup of tea. Okay. All right. He's agreeable. Yeah.